Welcome, Blogging Heads Nation. Um, my name is Neil Bhatia. I am a policy associate with the Century Foundation, and thank you for joining us for this uh, discussion on climate change. And I'm Tim Kovach. Uh, as Neil put it uh, when he pitched this to me, I'm an independent analyst on uh, climate issues, particularly focused on kind of the intersection of climate conflict and natural disasters. Uh, I'm based in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, and that um, that climate conflict nexus is something we'll definitely be getting to. There's also a lot in the headlines recently, so I think we'll kick things off with a discussion of the new report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Every five years they do a synthesis report, basically summarizing the state of the scientific knowledge that humanity knows about climate change and its impacts. Um, and among the headline sort of statements from this particular report is that if the world doesn't go zero carbon by 2100, we will most likely not be able to avoid the worst effects of future warming. Um, mm -hmm. So Tim, you've obviously read both the synthesis report, which is sort of a, a summary for policymakers as well as the nuts and bolts so I figured we'd kick things off with right. uh, your impression of uh, this most recent uh, set of findings. I mean, I, I, the the fact that the, the language the IPCC used this time is so much more dramatic and striking than it has been in the past. And I think that reflects <clears throat> the, the development of climate science and the sense of the urgency of the matter uh, as it has developed over the last 26 years that the IPCC has been in existence. Um, I think uh, Eric Holthouse at Slate said it pretty well yesterday when he said that what more is left for the IPCC to do at this point? Uh, you know, it went from 90% uh, confidence in, in the fourth assessment report in 2007 that, that humans were the pre predominant driver of uh, climate change that we've observed to 95% confidence in, in the fifth assessment report that came out last year uh, and the synthesis that came out this week. And I mean, the 95% confidence of causation is the same level of confidence that we have that smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer, for instance. Right. And, and so it's almost to the point where the, we, we've run out of adjectives, we've run out of adverbs, we, we've run out of ways to describe the urgency of the matter. Uh, it, it's here, it's now. I, I think one of the most striking things that the IPCC did this time was actually to say that it's not that we know climate change is happening and that it's going to affect us later, it's that the effects are being felt now and they're being felt on every single continent, including Antarctica. And so, you know, there, there's no way to hide from the results of this unless you just simply ignore them at face value, um, which unfortunately is, is all too common in our political discourse these days. Right, and I think, you know, part of the for the edification of the climate deniers among us. Um, there were two statements in particular that were um, sort of as foundational as you can get when discussing the, the evidence. And um, I'll quote from two of them. One is the period from 1983 to 2012, which is when we you know, more or less have the most accurate uh, knowledge was likely the warmest 30-year warmest period of the last 1,400 years in mm -hmm. the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and then if, you know, in case there's any doubt, people say, oh yeah, there's warming, but you know, it's, it's something that naturally happens and human beings either don't contribute much to it or there's nothing they can really do about it. You know, the second statement was, you know, emissions of CO2 from fossil fuel combustion and industrial processes contribute about 78% of the total emissions from 1970 to 2010. So this mm -hmm. is basically, you know, the scientific community saying there's no way, there's no reasonable way you can conclude that it's anything but human intervention that is causing this warming. Um, right. And I, yeah, and as, and as, I think it was interesting. And as Eric said, I, I I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I just think that, uh, yeah, going off of that, I think that the, in a lot of ways you can see the IPCC taking into account previous criticisms or previous uh, previous theses that have been posed by climate change deniers or skeptics, however you want to turn them, including the, the so-called pause or hiatus on warming over the last uh, 16 years. 
and they pretty easily dispel that entire myth uh, in the in the actual text of the of the synthesis, and also in the earlier working group one report that came out last year. Uh, and they show that the past three decades have been, as you mentioned, the the warmest period in the last fourteen hundred years, and every decade has been warmer than the previous decade. Uh, and so I, I I think that it's it's kind of a a sense that the IPCC understands the criticism and understands the role that they have to play to try to dispel those myths. And they're actually taking that into account much more so than they have in the past. Right. So it's almost like an ins a sense of institutional learning that has happened there. Right. And I think it's important to note for people that, um, like all UN bodies, this one is meant to have equal and full representation by all United Nations member states, and everything is done by consensus, and you have to get right. hundreds of scientists together and agree to this language, and then it's submitted to member states and they have to sign off on sort of the, the top-line statements it's going to make. And as you correctly referenced, in the past there's been criticism from many that these reports have been too timid because mm -hmm. it represents the concerns of certain governments around the world that um, sort of climate alarmism in their, in their perspective uh, would be uh, counterproductive to their economic growth or their political priorities, so on and so forth. So it is refreshing in this draft to see that um, they sort of moved away from that and we actually have what should be the last word on, on the science. Um, now, now, pivoting from that, we so we know we can conclude that this is happening, that human beings are responsible for it. And now the, the easy task is um, deciding what we, what we do about it. And as I mentioned right. before, um, the goal to minimize warming to you know, around 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which is what these scientists say we need in order to avoid the worst warming effects is a much more rapid and radical decarbonization of the economy from now to 2050 and then sort of moving from a low carbon sort of transitional phase, if you will, to a zero carbon phase by 2100. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you wanted to dig in a little bit to how feasible that is and sort of where we are now versus where we have to be. Sure. So I think the you touched on the, the actual level of decarbonization that the IPCC quotes to stay under, you said 1.5, but I, I think, you know, the, the two degrees Celsius mark that they talked about, which which got uh, basically adopted in the international community's consensus in, in the Copenhagen Accord in 2009. Uh, despite the whole debacle that was Copenhagen, we did come away with two degrees Celsius as, right. as what we define dangerous climate change. Um, and if you look at the report, it basically says that by 2050, the, the level of decarbonization has to be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 40 to 70 percent reduction of where we are now. Uh, and as you mentioned, by 2100, basically complete decarbonization of the entire global economy. That's a pretty daunting task when you think about it. Um, if you look at throughout the course of an, at least U.S. history, um, at, we, we've certainly seen a reduction of the uh, energy intensity of our per unit of GDP. So the amount of CO2 or energy that we're, we're, we're consuming um, per dollar of GDP output. But at best, that has taken uh, place at somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 to 3% 3, 3 per year. And if you've looked at the IPCC report and you've looked at other reports that have come out from various entities like the IEA and PricewaterhouseCoopers, et cetera, yeah. you'll see that if we continue at a 3% uh, reduction of carbon intensity per year, we're not even going to come close. Um, it, we have to get somewhere on the neighborhood of upwards of 5% a year, which has almost never happened in, in the history of, of at least the U.S., with the exception of perhaps during uh, you know, global economic crises. And so it, it's it's definitely a major challenge. And I think for me, as someone who's been kind of a, a you know, I guess you would, I guess the term that we use is climate hawk, and someone who's been a, a somewhat of a mainstream environmentalist in the sense that I, I'm concerned about, I have my concerns about carbon uh, sequestration and use of nuclear energy around various issues, both mostly economic. Um, but if you look at the IPCC report, 
I, at this point, I, I don't know how I can still hold on to those objections if I'm really serious and, and being intellectually honest with myself. Because the, the way that the, the IPCC terms it is that it gives you kind of an economic analysis of this is how much more difficult and how much more it will cost if we eliminate these technologies. And if we don't rapidly ramp up solar and wind production, for instance, it only gets marginally more challenging. Right. So uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five percent per yeah. year. I think. But that, if you eliminate, go ahead. Yeah, I think I, further to that point, um, there were a series of studies. I, I think it's out of Stanford. Stanford basically looking at various scenarios from um, from business as usual, which is what we're doing now, to mm -hmm. various levels of deployment of renewables, nuclear, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, and so forth, and basically none of them seem to work just on renewables and natural gas alone, or at least they don't do it in a way that is either ecologically or economically viable. And you know, there's been a debate, as you've suggested, in the environmental community about the extent to which you have to embrace nuclear energy, which uh, post Fukushima is, you know, it's a hard sell in a lot of places, right. uh, understandable NIMBY objections to having a nuclear plant in your backyard. Um, and so there's, you know, an inherent tension among Greens about, you know, well, are we more concerned about carbon or about nuclear waste, potential for accidents, uh, mm -hmm. non-proliferation concerns, which is a, a national security uh, and international relations aspect of this. Um, and so it's, it's very challenging. And as you, as you said, you know, the rates that you really need to reach these goals are nowhere near what anyone has really proposed. If you look at the Obama administration's EPA power plant rule, you know, mm -hmm. by 20, I think it's, I believe it's by 2030, you're looking at, what is it, like a 30% cut? And even that's yeah. Not, yeah. not, that's not really binding in any sense. They're basically getting together and saying, you know, we're going to have a, a bunch of individual state plans for lowering carbon emissions. And we think by the end, if you add it all together, you'll get this amount and, mm -hmm. and again, against 1990 levels, it's, you know, it sounds impressive uh, at first glance, but, you know, we were emitting a lot of carbon in 1990 as well. So it's not, it's not sort of the carbon negative path that you want to be on. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not doing too much better than most other industrialized countries of the world. Even the European Union's latest sort of carbon emissions targets uh, don't really, while impressive in a comparative sense, uh, don't also on their own really get you on the path to where you need to be. Um, so, it, I mean, it's beginning to look like in addition to the upward or uphill battle of mitigation, which is where you try to reduce the risk for future warming through emissions cuts, you're also looking at uh, a necessary focus on adaptation, which is um, right. how you start dealing with sort of the effects of climate change. And we'll get to that um, later in the discussion, I think. Um, but I think one final word on the IPCC, and there have been a couple different articles about this in the last few days since the report came out, one by Eric Holthouse at Slate and a couple others uh, that I've seen, is that, you know, where does, where does the IPCC go from here now that this mm -hmm. is the definitive word? Is it necessary or even a good use of resources to have these huge reports that are, it's basically a literature review of every scientific paper that's been published in a five to seven year span and regurgitated into a thousand pages of documents that you know, only you or I or a small handful of climate analysis will ever read in its entirety uh, whether that's mm -hmm. whether that's appropriate. 
Right. And I'll, one, one more thing before I get into that, I think, is that the if you look at what the IPC has said, as IPCC has said, as well as what the, the Carbon Disclosure Project and some other other groups have said, is that you know going into what you said about the, the the existing commitments of the U.S., the European Union, and other countries, if we take those at face value and just to extend those into the future, we come absolutely nowhere close to staying under two degrees Celsius. We're, we're on track for somewhere in the neighborhood of three point six degrees Celsius. And under current business as usual, we're actually in the IPCC's worst case scenario. Um, so the you know we we may actually have to end up pulling carbon out of the atmosphere in order to stay under, under two degrees Celsius, and that, that just ho opens up a whole host of other complicated issues that we're, either you or I can answer, and nor do we have the time or the expertise to do so. Um, <clears throat> don't tell, you, don't tell yourself short, Tim. We have, we have the expertise <laughs> to do it. Sure, we do. Yep, you and I will be the benevolent dictators of the world. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, onto the onto the future of the IPCC, and I elaborated, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Uh, I, I agree with Eric on the sense that what more can the IPCC do with these large assessment reports? You know, they've put out five of them now, and we've gone from more likely than not in, a, in a AR1 or FAR, I think they, they changed the term out, the, yeah. the abbreviations. Um, more likely than not that humans are the cause of climate change to 95% certainty, or what they call extremely likely. Is it, is it really going to make a difference if we spend the next five years working on AR6 and we go from 95% to 99% virtually certain that humans are the, the, the predominant cause of climate change? Is that really going to be what we, what we need to change the discourse? And are we, really going to spend, are we really going to benefit from spending the next six years doing research on something we already know the answer to when what we need to do is act now and not look into the question more? And so for me, I, I think that the, the day of the, the big assessment reports, report, its utility has, has long since passed. The IPCC has done what it was set out to do. It's educated the policymakers of the world, and it has uh, you know, provided the best assessment that we can put together of current knowledge on climate change. Uh, but, you know, the IPCC was formed in 1988. It's only a little bit younger than me. And I can say that in the last 27 plus years of my life, I've gone through a lot of changes, and the IPCC hasn't. And so uh, I think it's definitely time for, for some modernization. That's going to require funding for certain. Uh, the IPCC's budget for next year for actual publication and dissemination of those publications, I looked it up yesterday, was only $300,000. So if you really want to see the IPCC do something fancy like the National Climate Assessment that came out earlier this year, $300,000 ain't going to cut it. Right. Um, but I, I, if we can get some funding and we can get some change in the structure and, uh, and the purpose of the organization, which is going to be a dogfight, uh, I would really like to see the IPCC move away from these big, five, you know, six to seven year reports that they put together and start trying to keep up with the actual pace of the climate science and the climate policy as it happens and really be engaged in the discourse. So if we could turn the IPCC's website into something where it's issuing uh, shorter one off reports. Uh, on, on topics that are extremely important. What if the IPCC did a, a, a literature review of the question of whether or not the polar vortex is being caused by changes in Arctic air flows due to melting yeah. uh, Arctic sea ice, for in, Arctic sea ice, for instance? Um, or you know, looking at whether or not we have any uh, any data on you know doing some more discussion on geoengineering or something along those lines. Um, you know, the IP they, they've done these types of reports in the past. But even the one that I would personally be more interested in, the, the special report on extreme events, was 594 pages. I couldn't even get through that. Um, and so I think they need to, 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 to change from this extremely large thousands of page uh, type of model to a much faster moving one, um, one that has more funding, one that they, they're aware that they need to incorporate the voices of the developing world more. So I think that will be an interesting, to see if they, interesting thing to see if they can do that. Um, but also just trying to use their, their website to be up to date and active in the debate as it's happening rather than reactionary uh, as, it, as the body is inherently designed to be now. Right. And I, I mean, I think what you're seeing is sort of the, the, you know, platonic ideal of a UN bureaucracy that's sort of a, now a, a self-looking ice cream cone, um, that it has a mandate that it is very good at. Um, but it's probably very averse from a risk management perspective of branching too far out. Um, I would endorse certainly your idea of sort of doing peer review scientific after action reports on extreme events. So, you know, when you have something like 
a Hurricane Sandy, you mm-hmm. can follow up, you know, within two or three months with a document that says, you know, we talked to 100 climate scientists and they say the reason the storm was particularly severe is because of the combined effects of sea level rise as well as um, higher than seasonal amounts of moisture in the air and that, you know, these are attributable in, you know, X percentage to climate change on its own and, you know, if we don't do something about it, you know, we'll have more of them. Um, and I think I think your point about developing world voices is also of particular importance. Um, there are a lot of nations that simply don't have the, the resources to both face the everyday problems that they have with disease and poverty alleviation and, and so forth, and to also you know, sit down with a scientific team and say, okay, we have all this climate science, you know, now what do we do with it? And how do we pay for the things that we need? Um, And that's, you know, that's part of a larger discussion. I think we can sort of, that's a, a natural transition to the climate change negotiations that are due to take place in Paris to try to hammer out an agreement, I won't call it a treaty, um, Mm -hmm. to not anger the Obama administration, uh, (laughs) an agreement for some combination of pledged emissions cuts and technology transfer and various other things that hopefully taken together, you know, it'll be sort of a kludgy mess of things, but that when you look at it, uh, actually looks like serious action and one of the one of the major divides in this remains sort of the developed world developing world divide um, mm-hmm. an argument that's taken up particularly by India and China um, so much so that what you're now starting to see are sort of cracks developing within the developing world bloc because there are nations that are actually facing these effects now and facing effects that are, in many extreme cases, actually existential, that, you know, right. if you have island states like Fiji that might not actually exist because they'll be completely inundated by the Pacific, telling other developing world nations, you know, look, we know the West has a historical responsibility for emissions growth since the Industrial Revolution, and that's bad, and they should do stuff, but, you know, you guys need to do stuff too. China, you're not, you know, this is not the 1970s anymore. You're not trying to claw your way out of the Great Leap Forward. You actually are a modern Mm -hmm. economy. You have a lot of resources. You certainly invest a lot in clean energy development within your own country. You're a leader in solar and wind, and you're doing various other things as well. You know, we need to we need to start seeing more concrete things from you as well. Um, so I wanted to get your sense of what you see coming out of Paris with sort of these individual nationally determined contributions where, you know, nations are saying, oh, well, here's what we'll do. And, uh, you know, good luck to the rest of you. Sure. Um, I think that you're, you're right both about the divide within the, between the developed and developing worlds and the divide now, the divides that are forming now within the developing world itself, um, but also about the, the divide that exists within kind of the climate change community over whether the, the type of Kyoto, the Kyoto-like top-down uh, internationally binding treaty process uh, that, that, that divvies up cuts Uh, is the right way to go or whether there's more bottom-up kind of national sovereignty approach that they're proposing for Paris now where nations just uh, give their own voluntary cuts and then try to uh, act as a check on each other is the right way to go. Uh, So we'll touch a little bit about on on some of those. Um, 
One on the developing world issue, <clears throat> uh, I do think that there's some very clear uh, fractions that are or fractures that are developing. It used to be dating, back, dating all the way back to, to the 1972, the, the first UN conference on environment, uh, environmental issues uh, in Stockholm, all the way up through the present that you basically had the global north versus the global south. And that that divide, uh, side, you know, basically sidetracked the discussions and, and really undermined the efforts to uh, to bring about any any progress uh, at, at the global level. Because the, obviously, the developed world is overwhelmingly responsible for historical emissions, uh, the, whereas uh, the developing world still has you know so much to gain in terms of, of actual development uh, for their for their own citizens. And they see that the developed world has used the carbon intensive model for development uh, to this point and it has brought them prosperity. Uh, and th this really, I think this really came to a head last year at, at the conference in Warsaw, right after, which uh, occurred right after Typhoon Haiyan hit uh, the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 ba it basically turned the almost the entire conference into a discussion of what's called loss and damage. Um, basically, the, the developing world saying, to the developed world that things like Typhoon Haiyan or rising sea level affecting Kiribati, uh, you guys did this and we're suffering and you need to pay for it. Um, but but whereas the developing world was usually kind of in lockstep, they called their they have all of these weird acronyms that they use, but they call themselves the G77 plus China. Right. Um, the group of 77 nations plus China, even though it was a group of like 115 nations and, and China was just thrown in there for the hell of it. It was, it was, you know, whatever. <laughs> the, these cops are, are strange animals. Um, but like you mentioned now, we the G77 plus China is really splintering. You now have uh, the small island developing state, the SIDS, which is one of the weirdest acronyms you're yeah. going to come across. I, I, don't, I don't know why you want to compare yourself to, to, to sudden infant death syndrome, but somebody didn't think that out through, uh, very clearly. Um and, and now even China and India, who, you know, historically, obviously, politically, they've been at odds. But in terms of the climate issues, that they, they've generally been on the same page. A lot of people see China uh, in the past few years is actually, you, you know, you mentioned they're spending a lot of money on renewable energy and on, uh, they realize that air pollution is a big issue. And so China is being a much more positive partner than India has been. Right. Um, do we know that? Do we know what India is going to do in Paris? Do we know if if Pres or Prime Minister Modi is even going to show up? Do we know if Prime Minister Modi is going to decide that he accepts the science of climate change this week, or if he's going to yeah. change his mind again? Um, yeah. For, for those so, who for those who don't know what uh, Tim is referring to, um, the Indian Prime Minister, who's actually written a book that I've been told is a very strange book on climate change, um, <laughs> gave a very bizarre statement. Um, in a speech to Indian school children that was televised nationally, um, where he sort of went off the rails about what climate change actually is and things about human beings going against nature and it's not the climate that's changing, it's us. And it was a very muddled statement. Um, there was no clarification from, you know, either South Block or uh, Racecourse Road about what what exactly it was he was talking about. Um, and this it was soon followed up by him not attending the climate summit in New York City in September. Uh, they sent the environment minister instead. Um, and, you know, this you know, India is a case where um, they've, they've made great strides in property alleviation over the last 30 years, especially since 19, the reforms in 1991. Uh, but there's still a long way to go. Um, the World Bank figures for for people without access to electricity, I believe it's something in the order of 380 million people uh, don't, mm -hmm. don't even have daily access to electricity. And, you know, this is a country with uh, that has a large natural endowment of coal. And right. so it's almost, you know, it's a moral argument. Can you really tell India that the global climate is more important than turning on the lights for every Indian man, woman, and child. And, you know, so the way that you try to think to get around this is, okay, we want the Indian economy to grow, and we'll estimate that they'll be using coal for a while, at least into, into the 2030s, 2040s. And so how do you sort of bend the curve after that, and so you're looking at sort of the deployment of renewables, which the Indian government, both this Indian government and the, the Singh government before it, 
have invested a lot of money in at the the federal level. Uh, different states have also have their own sort of programs for this. Um, and they also want to do a lot with nuclear as well. Um, but, the, the, I mean, the, the bottom line is, is, is they're not going to accept binding cuts. They'll, right. they'll likely accept, you know, carbon intensity targets. Well, they'll say that, you know, as you pointed out, you know, per unit of GDP, the CO2, you know, will we'll try to reduce that over time. Um, but, you know, we can't, we're not going to legally sign on to something where we're deliberately slowing down our economy. So the alternative to that is essentially to pay them to do it, either through mm -hmm. extremely generous technology transfer initiatives and clean energy cooperation with India is a, is a priority of the Obama uh, Department of State and Department of Energy, um, but also through instruments like the Green Climate Fund, which is uh, a UN, it's a worldwide fund that the developing uh, developed world sorry is supposed to pay into to finance projects in the developing world to uh, reduce carbon uh, the problem is is that uh, with many foreign aid projects it's basically not really funded by anybody in the developed mm -hmm. world there were promises made at Copenhagen and to date I think Germany and maybe a couple of other nations actually pledged money to it um you know but basically the the coffers are bare and right. i think you know the bare minimum that you might you will see out of paris most likely is our actual more pledges that have a dollar figure and some sort of timeline uh attached to them i i strongly suspect the obama administration will will make a pledge that somewhere in the one to two billion dollar range um, to pay into this, and we can discuss this later whether the new Congress will actually let them let them do it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, this is this is sort of the the small bore stuff that I think you'll see in Paris that everyone hopes will add up to something substantial and. Certainly, compared to what came before it, it will actually seem pretty impactful. But um, as with the, the national emissions targets, whether it brings us on the zero carbon path we need is is something else entirely. Right, and I think that <clears throat> ever since the the failure of of uh, Copenhagen and the you know the the lack of imagination, I guess I would put it from Kyoto, where, you know, even if Kyoto had been fully implemented successfully, we were looking at a 5% global carbon reduction, which is not nearly uh, enough to deal with the issue. Right. And it, uh, I mean, I, the, I, the main knock in the United States against it was lack of participation by India and China, among others. Right. And that's sort of, that's not gone away as a talking point. But I, I think that I'm actually... It, if Paris goes as we all hope it goes, which again is a question uh, that, that's on the table that's extremely important because pretty much no conference has gone as it was supposed to go to this point. Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the potential outcome because we're shifting from, uh, from kind of a clunky hard loss, uh, hard international law structure of these binding targets from the top down to more of a soft uh, law, you know, kind of naming and shaming, nudging countries along. And I, I, I tend to think that that's probably going to be the more effective approach to dealing with the issue until we get to the point where countries are willing to actually divvy up a global carbon budget. And I don't see that coming anytime soon. Yeah, neither do I. Um, and so I, you know, you can look at the, the history of these types of soft law approaches. And even though they aren't legally binding and they're not enforced with some sort of, of inter you know, international governmental body behind them to, to demand uh, compliance, Oftentimes, they're very successful. So if you, uh, I'll, I'll give one example, which is the, in 1997, the UN passed what it's called what it, uh, its Water Courses Convention, which right. kind of defined the way the, the rules that exist between uh, countries who share transboundary water sources. So say the Nile River or the, the Indus River in India and Pakistan. And that was based off of these uh, what this uh, this international body that, that oversees water law created a set of rules in Helsinki, 
And uh, it, so the, the Water Courses Convention basically adopted these Helsinki rules, uh, put them into place, and then sat there for 17 years because there weren't 35 countries who had, uh, who had agreed to sign and ratify the agreement. Uh, and that finally changed in, I believe it was August of this year. Um, we now have our 35th party when Vietnam joined. The U.S. and China are not going to join the convention anytime soon. No. Um, but, but in the course of that 17 years, water law has changed a lot. And the Helsinki rules are now completely out of date. Uh, back in 2004, the same, the same body that passed Helsinki met again on a different iteration and passed these updated Berlin rules that adopted a uh, principle of equitable use. Of, of shared water sources uh, and, a, and kind of a, in addition to the do no harm approach that they had before. And you see now that e the, the UN Water Courses Convention and the Berlin Rules, <clears throat> excuse me, even though the, the convention wasn't in place and these Berlin Rules aren't, aren't legally enforceable, they've kind of come to define how the international community approaches water projects. And so uh, the, I guess the, the buzzword that's spun out of this is integrated water resource management, yeah. which is considering all of the various stakeholders involved in water law uh, and water uses, whether that be industrial users, uh, individual users, farmers, etc. And if you look at, at projects that the World Bank or the UN Development Program or even the uh, USAID are funding, they're all adopting integrated water resources management as, as the baseline for their approaches. And they're all engaging with stakeholders and going down to the community level and really ad addressing these issues. And that's just, that's a, that's a victory of soft law. And so I think uh, having nations come together, agree to offer up these, these uh, internationally determined commitments, or sorry, nationally determined commitments, and then have the opportunity to, to review them and then basically you know, judge each other uh, because there's going to be uh, most likely the way that this has been described is that while it won't be a treaty under the existing UN framework convention on climate change, everyone's going to have to report every year, every five years, what their progress is on meeting these voluntary commitments. So if the US says through 2030, as we've already said, we want to cut, to, we want to cut our carbon emissions by 30% and come 2032, we've cut our carbon emissions by 23%, then the international community is going to be able to call us out. Right. And while that may not seem like much, if you look at the way that that's happened, especially for the private sector, that type of uh, with the way that, say, activists like Greenpeace or other uh, other nonprofits uh, and non-governmental organizations have approached the issue, this type of naming and shaming stuff has been very successful. And so my hope is that if you uh, if you get this agreement and we get on on track uh, with these voluntary uh, uh, commitments that are supposed to be due in March of next year, hopefully get us somewhere on the path to, to, two, to two degrees Celsius, though that, that's a different topic for discussion. Um, and then if you put in place some sort of uh, a framework where every five years, say, you re revisit, reevaluate, and then have to ratchet up those commitments to stay on the track that the IPCC most likely is informing the, the, the international community, I, I hope that, that that's going to be an effective way to deal with, cli with climate change. Right. That said, if you look at the Copenhagen Agreement uh, and the, the voluntary commitments that we that parties put into place through 2020, as I mentioned earlier, we're on pace for 3.6 degrees Celsius of warming. So whether you know Paris may be the the framework we need, but it may not necessarily be the framework that gets us to where we need to be. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the right way to frame it, and um, you know we'll we'll avoid calling it a coalition the willing to fight climate change. We'll. <laughs> We'll spend some time between now and March thinking up another name for it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think sort of discussing the effects, um, one interesting debate in sort of the U.S. national security sphere, uh, if you will, is what impact climate change will have on sort of U.S. national security and foreign policy interests. Mm -hmm. and. So to kick this off, I'm, I'm going to read a line from the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is meant to be the principal long-term analytical document for the Department of Defense. And they, they talk about climate change this way. The pressures caused by climate change will influence resource competition while placing additional burdens on economies, societies, and governance institutions around the world. These effects are threat multipliers, threat multipliers, that will aggravate stressors abroad, such as poverty, environmental degradation, political instability, and social tensions, conditions that can enable terrorist activity 
and other forms of violence. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this paragraph, and a lot of it's been sort of hashed out in uh, the academic community as well. Um, there's a new paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research called Climate and Conflict by um, Marshall Burke, Solomon, Siang, and Edward Miguel, mm-hmm. who looking at, you know, historical data sets of uh, interpersonal violence and weather patterns basically boil it down to what appears to be a strictly mathematical formula that with every one sort of, um, oh, I'm blanking on the, um, standard deviation, say one standard deviation increase towards warmer yeah. temperature, uh, increases the probability of interpersonal conflict, uh, 2.4%, so that's sort of, uh, you know, petty crime and, and things like that. And then intergroup conflict, which is wars and riots and so forth, by 11.3%. Uh, so that's a, that's a very interesting thing to write down and put on paper, and it's, uh, it's a very controversial thing to say, um, because rhetorically saying that climate change causes conflict um, is is problematic at first blush for a couple of reasons that I hope we'll get into, um, which is why I think you know organizations like the Department of Defense use threat multiplier and stressor and aggravator, um, mm-hmm. and you know, even the IPCC in its report, um, you know, called it um, will indirectly increase the risks of violent conflict. Um, right. So, I mean, why don't you go into a little bit more detail about sort of the way you see the climate conflict nexus and this very complicated question of, of causality? Yeah, and I think the, the question of causality is really at the heart of this conversation. And it's kind of, it's a lot of insider baseball and the same groups of people having the same fight over and over again in, in, in very uh, kind of closed off and, and in some ways esoteric channels. So the Burke and Sang and Miguel and a couple of other colleagues are all at UCLA, uh, UCLA or, or Berkeley, they're at Berkeley. And um, they, they put, they've put out several of these reports dating back to 2000 four when the first one uh, came out from Miguel and uh, I'm biking on his, his co-author about the the effects of changes in precipitation on uh, violent conflict and they followed that up with several a series of several papers including one that got a lot of attention back in 2009 which suggested that in sub-saharan Africa every increase of one degree Celsius of global temperatures will lead to an additional 393,000 uh, will lead to a certain number of battle deaths, and they calculate that based off of global, based off of warming trends. That by 2030, we'll have 393,000 additional battle deaths in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And you look at that, and you're like, "Wow, that that really catches your attention." And then you look at it a second time, you're like, "What are you talking about? How could you possibly come up right. with that number?" Uh, because it, it, it's one thing to say that if you look at the, the historical trends and you look at the relationship and you look at the drivers of conflict that we have identified through other, uh, other you know, uh, statistical models, that sure, it, it seems like climate change could aggravate the stressors that lead to civil conflict. It could uh, you know, lead to, to food price shocks. It could uh, change the flows of renewable water resources within countries' borders and across borders. Um, it could increase temperatures, which might cause drought and might drive people to, to, to move from one location to another. Uh, all of those things are, are feasible, and there's a lot of research that backs it up. But at the same time, the research to this point uh, with, with these types of, of global statistical models uh, are very complicated. They're very, uh, very much in, co- in conflict with one another. And it's really difficult to say with any level of certainty what, what's going to be the outcome from changes particular changes in, in, in uh, global and global climate models uh, on these on these types of conflict dynamics. So if, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was I read two papers that came out a few months ago. One, uh, they both looked at uh, essentially changes in temperature and changes in precipitation on civil conflict using very similar models uh, and very similar data sets. 
One said that it's temperature, not, not changes in precipitation that leads to additional civil conflict. The other said it's changes in precipitation, not temperature, that leads to, uh, greater, to, to greater levels of civil conflict. Yeah. And, and for the, the, the general public who get these headlines fed to them, uh, and, and oftentimes these, these very uh, uh, over-the-top headlines that climate change is going to lead to more rapes or is going to cause 393,000 more battle deaths, right. it, it creates this false sense of, of certainty and this false sense of causation. Yeah. When the reality the is that... Yeah, I guess you would call it environmental determinism. As a, right, yeah, it goes it, it it goes back to that that yeah that that debate that happened uh, that really took off in the early '90s um, with especially with Robert Kaplan's piece in Foreign Policy about the coming crisis. Yeah, um, and, and it, this this sense of environmental anarchy, determinism is coming anarchy, right? Yeah, the the sense of environmental determinism that uh, changes that our geography. Uh, our climate, our environment inherently shape the way that we, we live and our level of development and the way that we interact with each other. Right. And the reality is that if, if I, I don't think you could find two more complicated variable variables in the world to try to analyze than than the global climate system yeah. and violent conflict, right. and then to smack them at, into each other and say with any level of certainty, what the outcomes are it is, is, it's astonishing in a lot of ways yeah. that, that it, it, it's all, I don't want to say arrogant, but it's just, we have such certainty in these models that we've built that, that we're willing to, to, to try to brush aside levels of uncertainty yeah. that are, that are astonishing. Yeah. That's why, that's why I actually think the DOD, um, has actually done this in a very subtle and helpful way in basically focusing on, on institutions in sort of their mm -hmm. discussion of climate change and conflict. Because, I mean, whether, whether it's not going to cause conflict, it's whether interacting with how human beings act that will cause conflict. Right. Um, and so, I mean, to take one example in Syria, in the years preceding the outbreak of civil war in 2011, you saw a historic drought in much of the rural countryside in Syria that was a major driver of internal migration into the cities. And so you mm -hmm. have you know, thousands of people moving from the countryside into serious cities that those cities don't have the carrying capacity to provide for them. And you couple that with the Assad government's sort of authoritarian rule and you have sort of the perfect mixture for conflict which eventually did break out now do you say right. that climate change caused the syrian civil war no i don't think that's right i think assad's mismanagement of his country caused the syrian civil war and that mm -hmm. climate change was a factor in that in changing the the contour of the conflict in a way that was much more destabilizing than if that drought had never taken place. But I think with, with dealing with the institutions as they were on the ground, that's what's caused, that's what caused the conflict. And right. it'll be very difficult for you know, someone to say the extent to which climate change caused it. I don't think you can put sort of a, a, a number on that. Um, but it's important to acknowledge and it's important that, you know, the, the intelligence community, the defense community takes that into consideration when uh, assessing geopolitical risk uh, worldwide. Um, and you sort of avoid this, the simplistic, you know, X caused Y sort of mathematical formula where you, where you could plug in climate change or, you know, a flood or a drought or a crop mm -hmm. failure. Um, and, and I mean, there's a similar argument for the Arab Spring writ large where, you know, global food prices spiked in 2009, 2010 because of droughts in various places, wildfires in, in Russia that um, were sort of anomalous. And that caused food price shock. And then the food price shock led to civil unrest in places where a lot of, you know, poor and marginalized people no, could no longer afford their daily bread. Um, right. 
But again, I mean, you're looking at places where it's the the government institution on the ground that is the that is the, I think the most salient variable in all of this. Absolutely. And then that climate change and its effects is a, an additional contributing variable that's um, important, but ultimately inferior to sort of that first order um, concern. Absolutely. I, I think uh, I'll touch a little bit on Syria and then offer another brief case study uh, or example that, that, that goes into that. Uh, one thing on Syria is this has been studied and written about a lot uh, by a lot of smart people. And I think the, the Center for, for Climate and Security is a, is a very good, very good resource on this. And they've put out a lot of, of research on this. Yeah, no, they're, they're but you had, people, yeah. But you had Tom Fried and, uh, and, and the, from the New York Times, who was in the Showtime series, in which he made that connection and, based, and tried to, and essentially tried to trace that causal chain, saying that climate change caused this drought, which caused this migration, which caused this unrest, which caused this civil war. And it really gets into uh, whether or not you can, how you want to define cause. And so, one of the big issues is we're treating climate change um, as though it's somehow completely removed from, from the model, which is exactly the opposite of what the IPCC is telling us. We know for a fact that climate change is a man-made problem. And therefore, can we really say it's an exogenous variable? Right. Or is it already, is it, is it built, baked into the cake? Yeah. Uh, it's, and, not, and, it's, not, so, it's not an alien invasion from Mars right. that's causing conflict. It's, um, you know. It, yeah. it's, and the problem was, ex and as you mentioned, the problem was exacerbated by the, the Assad regime's horrible mismanagement of Syria's limited water resources. Right. And so the, the drought was, was man-made, but it was not necessarily man-made specifically because of climate change. It was man-made because of a, a confluence of issues. And, and you'll, you'll hear me argue until the cows come home that there's no such thing as a, quote, natural disaster. All disasters are in some way man-made uh, man phenomena. Right. Um, I, and, and on to Sudan, as it illustrates what you said about institutions, um, there's been a lot of discussion, especially around 2007, when it was at the height of the Darfur crisis, uh, that climate change, that, that Darfur was the first climate conflict. Uh, Ban Ki-moon basically said as much and talked about the, the role of climate change in, in leading to what the international community generally considers to be a genocide, uh, as well as a violent civil war. And if you look at the, but a lot of people, uh, including Alex DeWall, have, have thrown, who are you know, basically experts on, on the Sudan, have thrown up their heads and said, you, you guys are missing the point. Sure, climate change has caused recurrent droughts, has caused uh, changes in, in, in water resources, has caused uh, food, food uh, price shocks and things of that nature. But prior to the, uh, the, the kind of radicalization and militarization of the country by the al-Bashir government in Khartoum, the, there were institutions on the ground that already existed to uh, to resolve these conflicts, and so when someone when, when pastoralists fought with farmers over who had access to, uh, to to this territory or to this watering hole, they were able to come. The chieftains were able to come together and say, "How can we resolve this peacefully?" Well, when you undermine those institutions through various government reforms that took place that that don't benefit the people on the ground, and then you pump AK forty sevens into the situation. Uh, the, the institutions no longer exist to resolve those conflicts peacefully, and then you have violence. Yeah. And, and to, to try to, to ignore the, this incredibly complicated causal chain and just say A causes B when, in fact, there's A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3, A sub 4, A sub 5, and so on and so forth that play into this model and feed back on each other it, it is, is reductivist. Yeah. I mean, the way, and, uh, and I, the way I like to sort of frame it is that, I mean, climate change is a development challenge first and if you fail the development challenge then it becomes a security challenge absolutely um, I, com I completely agree with that uh, I, I guess if I would say the, the if I had to pick like a couple of headline statements that we can comfortably say based on the research that's available uh, I would say probably one that uh, when you're changing something as over as overarching, and that that underlines every other every other facet of basically the development of human civilization, like our existing climate. Uh, it, it's hard to see how it could not affect something that exists within that atmosphere, like violent conflict. Um, when, when you know the human civilization developed within a very broad, within a very narrow range of, of climatic conditions, and when you throw those out of kilter, things are going to happen. 
That there's no doubt about that. Right. Um, another one is I, I think there's there is a plethora of research out there that shows some connection between climate change and conflict, whether that's that uh, higher temperatures will cause migration or that uh, more rain will cause floods that wash out infrastructure and make governments less able to adapt to rebel groups or something of the nature. We don't know, but we know that there's a relationship that exists and it's a relationship that warrants further study. Right. I, um, I think that's exactly the, the way to, to sort of try to think about this uh, going forward and avoid simplifying what is uh, an incredibly complex uh, debate. Uh, I think we're... There's a lot of... There's, oh, go ahead. I, said, I, I think we're close to running out of time. I just wanted to okay. spend the last couple of minutes um, to talk about last night, um, which uh, we're taping this Wednesday, <laughs> so this would have been, of course, the midterm elections, which were, you know, to use your favorite adjective, thumping, shellacking, <laughs> uh, whatnot. I'm, I'm going with blood... I'm going with bloodbath. Bloodbath, okay. Okay. <laughs> For, for congressional Democrats um, and Senate Democrats, too, of course. Um, just, you know, a quick couple minutes. What impact do you actually see this having on anything that's currently in the pipeline? So thinking first and foremost about the EPA um, mm -hmm. power plant rules. I think uh, to a large extent, in some ways, this won't change the equation. Um, the Obama administration has had a recalcitrant Congress for several years now, and he's had, you know, ever since the failure of the, the, clim of the climate change bill back in 2009, 2010 to get through the Senate, uh, he, he's, he's known that, that, that Congress probably wasn't going to be the way to get this done. And so the EPA uh, approach is through executive action. He doesn't need Congress. I, I have no doubt that that the Republican Senate now that uh, that it will come into place and Mitch McConnell will try to uh, to try to pass through the instant the body uh, a House bill that would remove the EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases. Uh, one, I don't know that that would get through a, a Democratic filibuster, and two, I can guarantee that that won't get past uh, President Obama's veto. Plan. Right. Uh, no, I think uh, there's. Go ahead. No, I think we're you're going to see more of the same. Um, perhaps a little more more strident, but I think mm -hmm. with regard to the EPA power rules, Congress is less my worry than what individual states might try to do in the courts. Absolutely. Uh, especially since, you know, in addition to a federal sort of semi-wave, you've also seen a lot of state legislatures fall uh, to single-party rule by the Republicans. And... I'm sure there will be well-financed legal challenges um, beginning in sort of local federal district courts going all the way um, to federal appeals court and the Supreme Court may or may not hear it depending on whether they think they settled the law in the Massachusetts case or not. Um, but I think you, you, you're likely to see, I think, two sort of trend lines one where you have blue and bluish states try to make the best of this, um, assuming that, as most people I think nowadays are, that it will be Hillary in 2016 and she, she will be likely to win, uh, making the best of the EPA's willingness to work with states on individual plans. And then the, the second trend line will be recalcitrant states that, um, similar to the Medicaid expansion or setting up Obamacare exchanges, that will throw themselves in front of reform, uh, or throw themselves in front of the rules, I should say, um, as much as possible. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think that there's going to be it's the fact that the, the fact that congressional Republicans now control both chambers of commerce uh, is going to make life for the Obama administration kind of living hell when it comes to environmental issues. Um, but they're only going to be able to nitpick on the margins. They're not going to be able to upend the apple cart, if you will. So I, I would imagine Gina McCarthy, the EPA administrator, might want to find office space on the Hill because she's going to be called in front of so many congressional committees that yeah. she's probably going to spend more time there than she will in her actual office at the EPA's headquarters. No, I think that uh, there's going to be effort. 
there's going to be efforts to defund the EPA, there's going to be efforts to defund the UNFCCC and the IPCC, there's going to be efforts to determine what the, whether or not uh, the Department of Defense is allowed to consider climate change in its QDD, in its QDR going forward yeah. and things of that nature. Um, but I, th I do agree with you that, that in a lot of ways, the real fights are going to happen at the state level. You know, we're already seeing this in a lot of issues, that there's basically a, almost a development of, of, in direct contrast to what President Obama said in his 2004 Democratic National Convention speech, a, a, red state, a red America and a blue America, where in the blue America, you're most likely going to have uh, these types of carbon regulations in place, whether that be a cap and trade system that exists in, the, in, the, in uh, New England and in California, um, whether that be renewable energy standards, things of that nature, yeah. you know, these these blue these blue states have same sex marriage. They have, uh, you know, some of them are now getting legalization of marijuana. They have the Medicaid expansion, right. and so there's a very stark divide between these two, these two states. And I do think that the the real issue is going to happen at the state level. You know, here in Ohio, uh, unfortunately, in June we were the first state in the country to to uh, roll back and accept in, in essence our existing renewable portfolio and energy efficiency standards. And last night, uh, the Republicans absolutely obliterated the state Democratic Party. Yeah. Uh, at, uh, the Democratic candidate Ed Fitzgerald lost to the incumbent John, uh, in the John Kasich in the gubernatorial election by 31 points. Uh, the Republican Party currently holds more, ste more seats in the state legislature than any party has ever held in the modern era. And uh, we're, we're trying to decide in the next two years whether or not we're going to revise or repeal entirely our existing energy standards. And that's not good. And that's all of that's going on in the background of the EPA saying you have until 2016 to tell us what your state's plan is to, to address carbon pollution or else we're going to do it for you. Right. And so this is going to be a very interesting two years with states like Ohio and Texas suing the EPA and whether or not we're hopefully the EPA. I would hope the EPA standard, and I assume you would, would stand up in court. But it's going to be a, a knock, a, a, you know, a, a bare knuckle fight. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to cost millions of dollars of taxpayer money. And it's going to be ugly, and it's going to undermine the EPA's ability to do what we need the EPA to do. Exactly, exactly. Um, we should definitely revisit this in February after the new Congress has been sworn in, and we'll see where uh, their priorities now are, will be then. Um, but for now, thank you for uh, joining me, Tim, for this uh, enlightening and great talk. <laughs> It was good. To, thanks for having me, Neil. I'm glad this. I'm glad you came up with this. It was a lot of fun. Yep.